Hello everybody, I'm here today with Tony Blake for our, I don't know if it's our fourth, fifth or sixth <laughs> podcast, <laughs> but we're going to today hopefully discuss Zoroastrianism, which is, and see where it takes us from there, which is one of my favourite religions, because I'm very into this good versus evil, which Zoroastrian was mainly about, that there's the dark side and the light side. So Tony, over to you, what would you like to say about Zoroastrianism and I hope Zarathustra, Ahura Mazda and Araman. Araman, wicked Araman. I'll give us sort of from this. There is first of all to say that it is not at all cut and dried and simple what was the Zoroastrian system. And it did go through many changes over time. And there is not even agreement on when Zoroaster lived. Some say he lived, well, remember a thousand years BC, and others he lived 600 years BC. Uh, there are many arguments about his birth, and there are also many arguments about the, the theology, if you like, the system. Interestingly enough, there is a, a strand of scholarship which has looked deeply into the Gathas as the hymns of the Zoroastrians and really are quite sure these were composed by Zoroaster himself and they have analyzed them to see that in the composition of these hymns there was embodied a certain knowledge to do with the kind of teaching that Zoroaster brought and it was related to Thing we can't go into it at this time very much, which interests me, that method of called a ring composition, where about a hymn or a story could have a hidden, not a hidden, but an inner structure in which more subtle ideas could be presented. So having more than one, one meaning? Well, yes, well, not in the simple sense of um, being open to interpretation, there is that, but it can be very uh, strictly aligned, I just think, for example, and, I spoke to you about my old friend Simon Waveland just over the way here in University of London years back and he was into this ring composition and he made the study of Rumi, Rumi's Masnavi book one called Mis uh, Rumi's Mystical Design and it was a beautiful, for me, very beautiful um, presentation he derived from this because first of all, you can, I think one can easily visualize what I'm going to say. You get, uh, a book, a narrative, and you just put the elements in it in a circle, and then you can see there is a kind of like a, it's it's like two halves. In some ways, these, I, to me, symbolically even represent. A lot of people disagree with me. The two sides of the brain, and so on. And this is as people have. Well, now I'm going to go off into Ted Hughes and his idea of Shakespeare. But let us come back from that. Um, and so there is, in this uh, division, and interestingly enough, it is reflected in things like the Enneagram, between the left and the right side, so that the left is more inward and the right more outward, and also the right part of the cycle is going outward from the source, and the left side is coming back to the source, returning, so it's involution, evolution, all these kinds of associations, which are absolutely remarkable and beautiful. Uh, uh, so you get, um, Simon Weidman in his book on Rumi says that in the, you get what you get in the first book are six stories and they're repeated, but they're repeated in reverse order. The first set of stories presents these things about the goldsmith and the princess and the king and all these sorts of events and that from the point of view of man. Of our human intelligence. On the left hand side, the same stories in reverse from the point of view of God. So, from a divine purpose. Pardon? From a divine purpose. Yes, yeah. The divine perspective, so to speak. But he then said, What's in the middle? That's where these, you know, you have a picture, a circle, and then some lines crossing, you know, inside the circle, just a simple picture, whatever comes to you. And, said, and then it produces a cent the central axis. I'm going to say actually, what is that? He said, that is the perspective of the seeker. <laughs> it's beautiful, yes, isn't it? it is. you know, the outer <laughs> and the divine, but the seekers, 
And this is what Bennett calls a psychokinetic. You know, often you get very confused in the wish interpretation. It's, 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 it's true. So anyway, there, there's all of that. So it's uh, like the bridge between... Yes. And only the <coughs> true seekers will go along that bridge. Mm -hmm. And those that aren't interested in seeking will stay That's on right. the man's side. Oh, uh, now you're releasing all kinds of <laughs> thoughts in my mind because you get the sense of this hinted at in that other novel. Another marvelous man, Hubert Benoit, I don't know if you've read his books on Zen and so on, he's an incredible man. But he talks about the central axis, which is that middle part in him, which is a, the human thing, which goes, um, in a way, transcends the divine and the mundane. Because um, there's part of a tradition which says that the, the seeking, you know, the really truly human side is something um, where we can get the reality directly, you know, not through, it uh, doesn't require either our outer knowledge or grace, but something just truly directly in ourselves, and that's a, a beautiful part of tradition that you can certainly catch on, and it's the direct path in, um, reflected in Hinduism by Inda and Bengali, the two nerve impulses which go outside, and there's also the Shushuma, which is the central axis. It's all in there, you see, it's all pointing to the same thing. Anyway, we're getting far away from Zoroaster. <laughs> <laughs> but this is going to be like that in this talk, you know, this wonder. You know, the, um, everything's connected to everything else, but some things are more connected than others, and some things are connected today, but not tomorrow. <laughs> 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 and it depends who you're talking to. Exactly, yes. <laughs> mm. so, but Zoroaster is important because he is a, taken to be he in a way, well, in general, and a lot of these, you know, roughly in general, can't be precise about because I don't know enough. You know, he was a kind of pioneer of religions. You know, he's like a forerunner of all the other reli of the monotheistic re Abrahamic religions. And what is it about? Because in him, you have this absolute strong emphasis on free will and choice yeah. and so his portrayal of the universe and so on was very much an ethical one uh, which you do find uh, reflected some comments of Gurdjieff may angel and devil go with you and all his side trust devil and so on which is his, his take on it and the idea of these two characters on on your shoulders, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, on your shoulders, that's right. And, and also the in absolute importance for our realization of temptation. We can't get nowhere without temptation. I mean, if you can look at it, sort of the niggas, it would be a doddle, <laughs> you know, we could just go for it, you know. What's yeah, the problem? It? You know, yeah. it would be yeah. interesting, would it? There's something in the central axis, whatever it is, but, you know, it's got to be. Like Bennett said, so dramatic, something interesting. So there is real choice, there is a real choice, but then what sets the stage for it, so he, I, I call it setting the stage going so much into theatre these days, he's got to portray this uh, cosmic drama. And so going back to just to mention again, there is no clear picture of the theology in Iran, as now it was the time Persia, where Zoroaster was born and, and worked, and from which came the Magi, you know, who came to see Jesus. For example, they came from Persia, from the Zoroastrian tradition, um, because we were smart people. <laughs> and so, yeah. so a really good half is that it has, it has, well, it's like four characters, but I mentioned three of them, you know. And a uh, mysterious character or role uh, was a zavan, which means infinite time sometimes, sometimes infinite time, and had various shades of meaning. Uh, and the scholars differ, they say, you know, some people say that it was the original kind of idea Zoroaster had, or before Zoroaster, and others say it evolved later because Zoroaster himself was strongly associated with this polarity, this duality between, as you say, good and evil. And the bad, so to speak, were represented by Araman, and the good by Ahura Mazda. Um, not the car. 
<laughs> Pardon? Not the car. What does car say? Not the car, because they named a car after a who. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Which I always thought was quite amazing. Oh. Well, you know. Well, it does come up and there's, there's other um, references you find in, in commercial products, and it's very interesting. In, in but anyway, there was this conflict, and so the you know, came later the explanation. So, Van gave birth to the twins. Now, this notion of the twins is actually fundamental in all ancient cosmologies, and it's like, it's like. You know, even down to Rome and Romulus and Remus and so on, and like one kills the other eventually, and this mm. kind of thing. It's so endemic in it, and it has to do with the, well, I say it has to do with my take on it, it's an abstract one, it has to do with this inherent nature of duality in our nature, you know, to do with the sexes, but also everything we look at becomes dual, um, and it has many, many subtleties to it. Like having the devil and the angel. <clears throat> on our shoulders is a duality. It's yes. a good side telling us to do one mm. thing, a bad side tempting us to do another. Yeah. Well, you know, the, looking ahead, you could go to denounce, do you say, this pernicious doctrine of the good and evil. <laughs> and so he actually sets his cap against that, which, in a sense, could say would start with Zarasta. You know, you know, the, um, and it's still now infecting America with his obsession with goodies and baddies mm -hmm. and the uh, man in the white hat, the man in the black hat. But the gives rise to these and, and you see in a sense, well, what will be the, what's the point of this? Why is it arising? You know, because they said, well, it's a Bennett sort of thing, I go back to Bennett's reference just to the concept, the words, the dramatic universe. It makes it dramatic because there is, what makes drama interesting because you've got goodies and baddies or, you know, mm -hmm. for, you know, the... Uh, love and hate and... Love and hate and all of that. Like that yes. know, if there isn't some kind of conflict in the drama, you do, it's not interesting, you know. <laughs> and uh, if everybody was nice, you wouldn't get people paying to go and see it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but, of course, the essence of all this it's, it's really simply, it's, uh, it would come out totally abstract. You say, you've got some principle which makes a difference, which introduces difference. Now, whenever you find difference in the world, in our common world, you, you find it associated with judgmental things like, you know, you say there's a difference between men and women, so one of them gets treated as inferior. Everywhere mm -hmm. where you get a difference, one of them is treated as lesser than the other, always. And so, this is a great problem in human thinking, really great problem, you can't. And so the, I'm well not saying so, but I'm now throwing in here other elements from science and from Bennett and so on, science, particularly Niels Bohr, who was um, the principle of complementarity, these like the wave and the particle, they're very different, but they're not like, kind of opposed to each other, but they, there's this difference. Uh, between them, which has to be realized, and so that one is not complete without the other. And so that is a very important notion, which is, I don't know where it got to in the um, Zoroastrian scheme, but it was obviously, well not obviously so much, but it is evidently something to be you know, regarded, is that you can't have one without the other, you know, this kind of thing. Because aren't we striving to get a balance then? Well... Is that the ultimate goal, to be balanced between the two, so that neither affects you, or or you can understand both sides? I understand both sides, but it's... Um, now again, all these subtleties about the principle here, but let me try and say this, that the... Uh, it's all to do, you can't have one without the other. You see, this is, you mean, that's, then, and that's a major act of understanding, you know. And it takes you free of this, they say, the judgment, this is bad and that's good, this is higher and that's lower, this is dark and that's light. You know the, the kind of infamous projection on women, which happens throughout all traditions and cultures, right, about this with differentiation. That's why a lot of women today don't want to say, well, we've got a different brains, brain from men because we would then be judged as inferior because mm -hmm. the difference means you know not that so yes. and there's and the only other room for not that is inferior whereas in the kind of creative realm it's the opposite it's the beginning of something new yes because and so the, the conflict is there you see and in a way men used to call it to say well this does it do 
spirituality does its main function is to provoke energy but then you enter the realm of will um, and your own act because it's not just these two principles that is be acting outside of yourself on you but you take a role you see and you're part of the process and the whole game changes you know <laughs> Comes magical. <laughs> magical, absolutely. Now, we're going to rush through all sorts of things. One thing I want to throw in at the beginning here about this conflict. Right? And there's one period where they had the idea of Zavan uh, decreed that Araman would be triumphant for 6,000 years. And where they got to, why that number was very strange. And then, because it had to be equal handed to the two of them. So that's a very strange thought, you know. Mm. Then, the other thing was that to do a cunning on the part of Ahuru Mazda, which is to do with, well, you see, as, so to speak, just those two principles, um, the issue could never be resolved. The balance, you know, after one comes forth the two, forever and forever. Well, he said, oh, with him, so he made the creation. Now, the nature of the creation is such that it is finite. And um, he enticed Araman into the creation to work out their antagonism which meant that whatever Araman would do it was still finite it would not be there for eternity mm -hmm. um, so it enabled it's, it's incredible possibilities you see it cascading out of this you know um, that the whole of this whole world around is a stage which is here at this period of the Rasna teaching so that Araman could be defeated Oh. Oh. that's um, quite something so is that saying that Arrow Man is ruining is ruling the right word ruling this world or? well in, in that version <coughs> yes in, in that particular version but just, just remind ourselves all the times you have different periods different people different times different versions with all these different versions around just a kind of combinatorial effort about making sense of the parameters they start with you see they just clash into mm. various versions and there isn't one doctrine which uh, forever is consistent and uh, it's in amongst I think amongst intelligent people of our own epoch and I was talking to some friends of mine about this yesterday as they, you know just in there isn't any um, total system where everything is in place it just keeps on spewing different variations all mm. the time you know, and, and but the old expectation was we could sort it all out you know like Aspensky searching for the system Goethe mm -hmm. <laughs> was too untidy he was a messing up he was got bored religion we don't want that we want the system but uh, where everything is in its place but there isn't any such thing and in a way if Spensky really some of modern mathematics, he would have understood this, you know, because we're in the realm of undecidability and incompleteness. Anyway. So, so in a way, Spensky wanted it to be very black and white, <coughs> but it's not. Everything's shades of grey, really. Yes, and more than that, you see, you see the, uh, uh, it's, in a way, it's impossible for everything to find its place at all. It's not black, it just you can't. Because if you can put it into order, then you can mm. have control over it, oh, can't yeah, you? Yeah. And everything's absolutely uh, set. And but when something goes wrong, mm. then it's a shock because you're thinking that's not followed the plan. That's right. That's right. And that's good. You often emphasize that in a famous passage, and you know when things turn out not as they expected, then you have a moment when you can realize that your role and your intelligence. You, know, you can't realize it before if you've got this order. And of course, if you have an order, then you say, "Why, well, let's um, identify with this," and you become a fascist and start <laughs> bullying other people and telling them what to do and telling them what's right and all that kind of nonsense. It's a, it's a very deep disease. So anyway, we don't get it. So I can't swear it. You know, there's any one system. There's a rest. But he introduced this 
element of you know, the human is then faced with this ch choice between the forces um, and you you know Steiner took this in a very his own way with his incredible portrayal of Araman against Lucifer with the Christ as the third force in it um, in his famous sculpture in the Gothianum. This is Rudolf Steiner just for those that have never heard of him. Yep. That's right, when who broke away from theosophy and founded anthroposophy uh, and also a very creative man in the realm of education and agriculture and movement and his eurythmy. But anyway, he had in the Araman was the in him is the character who is like the um, caricature, old caricature of the scientist who's cold blooded in a white coat, who vivisects and the, well Lucifer is the caricature of the artist, completely just obsessed with their own passions and emotions. Mm -hmm. And is a very useful image present to people about these two clashing in us and how Christ is beyond this yeah. because you know, you know you see pictures of, of this statue and Christ is no mamby pamby but he's a very strong <laughs> character well that's so that's in the background that's to do the law three we might get to a bit later but coming back to Zoroaster and all this and we did many things about the choice it's, you know, it's up to us and it was conscience and began to become possible um, in all of that and in, you know, how it developed in the Greeks, uh, you know, Socrates, this idea of the individual conscience and choice and so on became a, and in religions and Buddha work out your own salvation with diligence and so the human individual became more portrayed but it, it appears as Zoroaster anticipated all of this and he Develop the context for things like angels, and he had a Bahu Manu, a good mind, um, and this. Uh, so it's like changing from the old um, systems of the gods into these elements, which became things like, see, like, um, like the angels and the guardians and all this kind of thing. So he was an extraordinary fellow in, in many respects, and. So it's no, it was no longer <coughs> the gods directing us. We have to direct ourselves. Absolutely, yeah. The matter is, they're pulling on us. It's up to us how we respond. Uh, which amazing innovation, yeah, and really, really interesting because uh, by that time in Homer and so on, portrayed of people, they were just puppets in a sense in the hands of the gods, and there was no choice in do it. There was a hint in Homer. In that character of Odysseus, who why? Because he would go apart and sit quietly, and people didn't know what he was doing. But in modern parlance, he was thinking. Mm. <laughs> but people didn't really do it in those days <laughs> at all. Yeah. Because you just did things. You did things. It's only now. I'll kill you. <laughs> I'll rape you. Kill you. <laughs> Everything was like that. Uh, so that thing. Now we come back to Gurdjieff yeah. and I read. I said to you earlier before we started this, it very, got very um, more and more puzzled by his quite complicated um, description of things. And so he starts off with kind of three elements mainly, and he adds them later. But, um, well, I mentioned first of all, he talks about the merciless hero pass, which obviously is time. And is this taken in some way from Zavan? And, uh, so the jury is out on that. Uh, but the, in some ways it echoes standard physics, thermodynamics. Everything wears out. There is an increase in disorder. Um, and what is it sort of it means the diminution of potentials. Now this is how he describes then poor Mr. God in his dwelling, seeing his dwelling was diminishing. Which you know to keep you know, they treat the dwelling as potential. Um, and it's diminishing through the action of time. And this is then 
looking at it like standard thermodynamics. Now, there's not. It is a little bit like Zervan, but where who is Ahura? Ahura Mazu maybe like his endlessness. Who is always portrayed as the jolly good chap. <laughs> yes, is, the common creator. Common creator, <laughs> all loving and father, endlessness. <laughs> goes on and on about this, you know, and you think, well, is, is he such a rosy fellow that's going to mix out? I don't know. His endlessness uh, is, seemed to be um, a little limited in some respects. But, but he must be if he can see that time is eating up his yeah, place. Yeah. Well, that's a, yeah, you're right. There's the fundamental kind of duality thrown in at the beginning. Um, and one can know it's out of course in all cosmological schemes is never the resolvable things you have to find some literary device which said how do we get from one this to all the differentiation of the world you know yes. you've got to throw it in somehow get it in somehow and what matters is how smart you are in cooking something up you know, <laughs> you know the kind of thing in a lot of cultures like in Africa is like this spirit gets lonely oh. <laughs> you know so you've got to cook something up well, that's one standard explanation, or well, the other is about this, this, this dramatic thing about the running down. Because now let's pause and try and say something about such pictures as Gurdjieff is making. You see, you may think it's about, oh, this is wise guy and he's got access to how the universe was created. And you think, well, hang on, hang on, hang on, you know, look, look. What can he really be talking about? You know, always in these things, look for, you know, he's talking about us. Us human beings. Yeah, our situation. Mm -hmm. You know, what, yeah. you know, you bloody some holy sun absolute somewhere. Mm, I don't know. Um, his endlessness. And, well, you just pause and just consider maybe these are um, kind of like abstractions from the realm of our experience. Because how would we know about them otherwise? Is it by some kind of distillation of what we know, do know? Mm. Um, we all faced with the the terror of time. The terror of the situation. The terror of the situation, the terror of time. And that's why, and why the people have picked up on Gurdjieff the phrase, the war with time. Mm -hmm. And this is, Bennett picked it up very much because he was an astute follower of Gurdjieff's cosmology, but his cosmology is a way of getting him to understand our actual experience. And it was taken up also with um, Ben's pupils, or my pupils, and we have William Sullivan, who wrote about the Incas and their, their theology, about the war with time, and where it was related to um, astronomical discoveries thousands of years ago. Uh, because it was, you know, his facing up with with change and the the loss of the old order. Now this is a major, major theme, and I'm so astonished people don't pick up on this. Or because why let's talk about the loss of the old order? Because well, it's like well, first of all, have a picture of order. You mentioned order earlier, but, but the different moments of order, different styles of order, is not always the same. And so Bennett had the idea that there were these epochs and there was a kind of global mind order for about two and a half thousand years or whatever it was, and then a shift into another kind of order. Uh, this is part of the fabric of his dramatic universe, because he was saying like in the present day we're into a shift to another kind of global mind from the previous one. Um, and it was echoed, or not echoed, it was actually deeply considered by these marvelous people, Santillana and Von Deschamps in their book Hamlet's Mill, which is about the, the impact on human life and the discovery of, of course, the procession of the equinoxes, the way in which the whole cycle, the earth wobbles on its orbit and changes the alignment of the stars and it became taken as a change in the very nature of human life, right or wrong. See, I'm going on to say though, they said that what was called the flood is not to do with water at all, but to do with changes in the orientation of the earth towards the stars, 
So what goes below the s celestial horizon, as it were, was said to be drowned. So it meant the loss of the old order. Mm. And so then come to a new order. As we know very well, betwixt and between, it ain't easy. Yes, there's a little bit of chaos. <laughs> Absolutely. I would say, look, you know, the road system, you improve the road system, you cause havoc by improving it. And the shift is always awful. And it may be something going on now because the old order is gone, the new order is not yet born, so nobody knows what to do. And Some people don't want to let go of the old ways. That's right. People uh, don't like change. And then they're saying, yeah. We also emphasize, of course, we don't know what to do in this period. It's not been settled. We know what to do in a settled period. But that's an idea which, you know, it's prevalent in amongst uh, certain circles, so you get the idea that we face it too, that the, the order of things changes and we are to recreate something. Uh, so what is it? And so you get two ideas, you see, latent, and this is me just bullshitting around. Latent in Gurdjieff's story is that you make a, a world, so to speak, you, as you say, you um, project these, you call it the laws, the modified laws, into the empty space around the sun, absolute. Um, it's like you venture into the unknown. And I'm just now talking about this and following the images of my mind, you see, I don't know if it's true or not. But I thought this is nice, and what was this empty space? It's simply the unknown. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Gurdjieff dallies with this vision of whether God isn't all that knowing after all. Because <laughs> there are unforeseenness which happens and it's seeing to God litanical period, a period when God almost had to ask for help <laughs> and all these little tantalizing things to do. But I like the idea, you see, of in the unknown, we're entering the unknown and say, so what do we do? So we create something. What do we create it on? And it comes from these laws, but the modified laws. Um, so there'd be laws that fit this... Pardon? There'd be laws that we're trying to fit this unknown. Mm. So the laws have mm. to change in some ways. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's a beautiful... And you're just following the consequences, you know, predicting something out where you absolutely don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, in his descriptions, of course, the Gurdjieff was always assisting his endless, was very wise and knew what he was doing. And then it was all about this... Uh, or two kinds of things, which more or less the same things, you see. Because when going to that space, one of the features of it, different from the Sun Absolute, was that there was an outside as well as an inside. You see, again, this introduction, subtle introduction of the difference, outside and inside. When people, there wasn't that at all. There was no outside and inside. It was just... Just void. Just the, the void and, and the Absolute, and, and that was it. Uh, but now you get the outside and inside, so you can have... Uh, something connected with something through something. You know, this sounds a very simple thing to say, something connected with something through something. But be free to see that we're just connected with this thing through something, because this something was something independent, you see. And so this um, game made life very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, there's a nice little cosy, you know, you know, a little circle, and there they were. This is we know in life, you know, we get into this kind of struggle and so on, and suddenly a pierce on that field, and it all goes off in another direction. Um, I used to relate this myself to you know, the physicists, to um, what's called sometimes, and it tends to be avoided in physics, right? the three body problem. Um, the three body problem? Yes, so you can imagine in an empty space there are three bodies, not two, three. There are two. Whatever they're doing, set them off, any place, any movement, and you can absolutely predict what they're going to do. With three, you can't. Because you cannot could interfere with each other. Interfere with you just It's a very interesting exercise to visualise it and follow it through. It's very, very telling. Um, and quite a lot of people in, in, in refuse to believe it, but mathematical physicists have been trying for years to find, you know, you know, can we find the equations we could, you know, and, uh, predict as much you can't. So I've taken this to heart very much and say, you know, when you get to three, you can't, intrinsically, you can't know what's going to happen next. Mm. And people don't like that. No, no. They want to be able to guess or, you know. I remember some woman, you know, she was her, her husband was somebody in NASA and so on, 
was talking to her. She got absolutely furious with me. Don't you mean him implying my husband doesn't know what he's doing and sending that? I don't have nothing to do with it. Because, of course, the little rocket going to the moon and so on is so tiny in respect to the other bodies involved, so it doesn't matter very much, but in other realms it does, as a of the whole stability of this solar system, which Newton was very much concerned with, which is part of his own religion. But anyway, so that's, I mean, this is being very vague, I know, and Debbie, but it's just a sense, you know, the, what was this alteration? And then, of course, in the Law of Seven is where you get this intersection, you get a process going on, which is then kicked by other processes, process. intersections, yeah. you know, you see mm -hmm. all it is. We're creating this interactive fabric, um, and then, hey, presto, you know, get this, uh, ostensibly, this, uh, what, what is it, the maintenance of the universe, um, but is it, could it be more than maintenance, um, and really good if isn't clear about this, the, there's a lot about various aspects of it, not about this particular thing. Uh, because of the God's task was how to maintain his dwelling place, the realm of possibilities, to maintain it, uh, maintain his possibilities. So you look at that, um, and I'm, it's lovely talking to you in this context, which you set up for me, it's actually beautiful, and I'm just thinking, because this is really attracting into our souls, you know, the whole notion of immortality. What the hell is all that about immortality? Is um, the uttermost in maintenance. The utter what? The uttermost in maintenance. Oh, in maintenance, yes, to be able to live forever. Live forever, you see, why do people want to do that? I mean, there's something playing it. And I'll comment here, Debbie, about all this. I mean, going, taking Gurdjieff's ideas and following through, this is what I wish people would do. It doesn't matter, no matter to explain Gurdjieff for any sense or any trying to understand, but just follow up. What happens in you as you let these ideas come into you? What what happens to you? What you see, what you feel, what what you evoke, and so on. You know, I'm not interested in, in sort of in sense in your ordinary sense, understanding what Gurdjieff wrote at all. Um, so that. how it works on you, how it affects it you. Me. Yeah. Do you think many people switch off as soon as they find it too complicated? Whatever you know, mm. when it means complicated, it means that they have some effort involved. Why not have a bloody effort? What's wrong with you, weaklings? Well, people want things handed on a plate. Absolutely. And in the last seminar, I mean, we got into this thing about could I have a long term and about the word understanding. Let's say, but people use this in quite contrary sense to its ostensible meaning. Its ostensible meaning is that you stand under. But what people use it is when they stand over. That is, I understand something means I'm comfortable with it. You know that phrase, American phrase? Mm. Are you comfortable with this? And they say, oh, yeah, I'm comfortable. It means they've gone back to sleep. It's assimilated, and Gurdjieff describes this accurately in Beelzebub's Tales of Marvelous points on the reason of knowing, reason of understanding, which is genius, absolutely amazing. Up I mean, oh, means what people call understanding is the opposite, it's overstanding. Right. And then I had mm -hmm. one member, Morgan, you know, a musician, he came up with a lovely phrase, what about inner standing? <laughs> uh, so that's my way now. My way is a way of inner standing because I have to make something about all this stuff out of my own material. Mm -hmm. mm. My images, my sensations, my feelings. And I'm horrified by people. They kind of alienate themselves from their own material and project into this abstract realm and then they furrow the brows and write their explanations and it's pointless because it hasn't engaged their stuff. In Gurdjieff he was so astute in one of his lectures he talks about it, this work he said where does the work have to operate? He says in your essence. Said, but Presence can be lazy and stupid. <laughs> it's like a little child, isn't it? Like a little child, you see. You say, what do you need? You need, you know, as a personality, you can't do anything in a personality, because a personality can learn some stuff, which can enable them. Pass it on to the essence. And get it into the essence, that's the whole game. He, he portrays it so brilliantly, you know. You say, oh, well, let's forget personality in book learning. No! <laughs> you know? 
And you... Because they both need each other. Absolutely. But the stuff you see, this essence, you see, what is it? It's what you're born with. You know, it's in your genes, your blood, your guts, your environment, your air, your location. It's all this concrete reality is called, the, you know, in David Seaman, called the life that's called in technicality now, the life world. The life world. That's where you've got to do it because you've got no other material. Which you, if this other material is what you call vicarious, second hand, <laughs> it's no good. So we've got to do this. So coming back to these laws and you see this opportunity of talking to you in this way is so precious because it's so different from sitting in a chair with a pen and uh, just when there's only oneself and it's boring <laughs> <laughs> so not having the prepared script but instead being more spontaneous and doing it in mm. the moment doing the moment but this thing in the moment is can become just a cliche but is that because there is 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 this fresh material, so it's like raw meat. I don't know what the metaphor is, you know, it's something uh it's got this taste to it that nothing else has got. Um uh, and it's also very key to the oral tradition. But imagine it was all based on what could be spoken, you know, not written down at all. Why is that how power and why Socrates was so concerned about that and hated writing, or he said he hated writing, kind of thing. So, so as if I had a conclusion made from this. But <laughs> it is this, only now I see this unknown, you see, this is our, you see, you come from, it's like, uh, I don't know, I just make it up in this point of view, this projection of the laws. You know, he just uses the phrase, like, into the surrounding space. You know, like, what bloody surrounding space for that? Anyway, it's this emptiness. Um, later on, it becomes etherocrylnil, which you know takes from ether, which is the old word for the fifth element, which combines all the other elements, and was of course demolished in physics in the nineteenth century. But that's the ether. The ether is a substance making and creation. But just take it as this. You know, we have. Um, we're faced, you know, now can we identify ourselves with being his endlessness? Why not? Well, because, you know, time's running out. Time's that. eating us up. Yeah. And uh, as the Scottish philosopher John Locke put it, time is a perpetual perishing. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> yes, right, he's getting it up. So, I think, you see, this is what makes it like, I mean, like, there's an interesting part of Beelzebub, you know, the parts I try to look at that and his various descriptions of the laws and the planets and all of that and all that endless stuff about the substances and the law of Hepta Parapashinok and you flog away at this. Okay, it's good enough. It's good to flog. <laughs> Good to vlog. It's hard to understand. Yeah, no time, but, <laughs> but you see, what is your requirement for understanding? This is it. Uh, well, I want to bring out Debbie in this. Mm -hmm. you see, because I still think you pick it up from you. This sense, understanding means done that, got the T-shirt, been there. Yep. Now I can go on to something else. Thank you very much. I don't have to bother that anymore. So we've got to try to do what was it you were calling it? Inner standing. Yeah, inner it's standing. The, that's unending. on it. It's unending. It's, there's a lovely book by a man called Caius called Finite and Infinite Games. Have you ever come across it? I don't, I've heard the title. Who was you for again? Caius, C-A-R-S-E, something Caius, and he was his best book. It's absolutely brilliant. And I keep following myself to get back to that again. Anyway, the infinite game is, is the game in which you, um, the object of the game is in a way the game. Is <laughs> played? Yeah, you know, to be played. Play up, play up the game's a thing, it's an old um, English um, sentiment. But there's a finite game, it has things like winners and losers. And that's the difference in the infinite game, there are no winners or no losers. And a lot of people would, would, would be find that abhorrent, you know, it's got no termination, what's the point? Yes. And the, I just take a little time on there, a lovely simple illustration which may be effective for some people, not all people, but it's about is two brothers playing tennis. One is older. Of course what happens is that the older brother can always return 
the shot of the younger brother, younger brother, because doesn't often able to return the shot. So what's happening is that the older brother is getting bored and the younger brother is getting frustrated mm -hmm. until somebody got on this change the rules. See the usual rules where one sh you should be winning, you know one should be active and the other person defeated, that's the only game. No. Change the, game. the object of the game is to keep the ball in the air as long as possible. <laughs> then both of them could enjoy the game. Yes, they would. You see? It's, it's, it's simple illustrations are not exhaustive, you can pick holes in it, but I thought this is really good, that's the nature of the mm. game. And it would be more about playing rather than emphasising, like you say, on the winning or the losing. That's right. You know, get more interested in, in your purse, you know, $100,000 or whatever it is. Because I actually work with uh, footballers at the weekends and I try especially with the children, to say to them, enjoy the game, it's not oh, about man, the winning, absolutely. just go and play and You get any luck with doing that. Some, some <laughs> do, some understand, yeah. but it seems to be as they get older, it's more important about winning. Yeah. And it's like, does that yeah. become an adult thing? Yeah. We've got to be winners. You get so dominant in America, you know, this, you know, you're a loser, you know, so mm. only the first vision to make has a meaning and it's just this, and it yeah. becomes people judge you by whether you win or lose at things, right. and that's a shame because it should be, as you say, and taking you part. To have a game, you've got to have losers, so let's respect them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the graceful loser. I mean, the, all these sentiments which were around in the way traditionally is now wiped out. You know, there's not any American influence, but all that attitude of mine. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Eddie the Eagle because he used to just do his oh, um, skiing because he just enjoyed, enjoyed it and had fun. It. He knew he was never going to win, but he still had fun, didn't he? Absolutely. He, you know, and that's how it should be: go and enjoy whatever mm. you're doing in life, mm. whether it's a game, mm. work, whatever. Do it because you want to do it and get something out of it. You don't have to win, do you? You just have to partake and enjoy partake, it. Partake, you see, that's a very good. Reminder for me, and you know, this, you know, become that's the only thing we do is to participate. You see, because there's everything we possibly happen to do is there in the world. You see, in reality, it's there going on. All we can do is participate in it. We can't kind of make it up or do something different. What's, <laughs> what's happening anyway? You know, so we, well, it's just, you know, there is football, there is music. Uh, and many things which people have not thought of yet or recognised as such, mm. and, uh, but you find something you can join into. Now that side of things is, um, I think, very much um, a kind of promise of the new age and emerging, and you know it seems to be such a, a frail and hardly known thing. But in Goethe it misses a lot of this because there's still this sort of emphasis on um, um, isolated achievement in spite of uh, well but he's but he's magnificent in some respects because I always took a lot of um, appreciation of his um, brotherhoods and his societies like I hold on you know I love this uh, whole account I think it was was founded by Belcoltasi and he's this I've forgotten what region he was and what period but he just we began to suspect it was not, something not quite right within him. Mm. And I just, it was so vivid for me, so amazing. I think. Even like talking to him, that suddenly goes, suddenly in my mind, goes, oh, <laughs> you know. And then he said, and he says, it's like, he suddenly realizes something like he's, he's, it's a fake. He's not, it's not reality, it's a fake, it's something, you know. And he talks to his friends about this, and they look into it, and then get together, and they go, it was so for me, so inspiring. Um, but he had to go through all that. Belicotusi, I never remember how to say his name. Belicotusi. Belcoltusi. He had to go through all that to develop what he'd been pondering and learning, and then to come to the realization that it's not the be all or end all of what he'd learnt, was it? He realized, like you say, there was something missing, but he couldn't quite mm. put his finger on mm. it. Yeah. But he knew it wasn't right. And wasn't right, so he started, you know, as a genuine, what well, Grotowski was after with the very a sort of research, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, have a terminus, I've forgotten what the end of the story was, Akhaldan, 
Uh, they, it is something was there where people were then open to investigating in this way, and that should well, what we should you know should we come then should have been what the fourth way was all about. Instead, it's become just a thing of a coughing some practice or other some was invented by nothing to do with the reality, which is this tremendous appeal to what you can suss out yourself and um, open this door. Well, Gurdjieff was very on about pondering, didn't he? Pondering, pondering. Yeah, yeah. Think about what we're doing. Don't just believe me, mm. but verify mm. for yourselves. And that's another thing, pondering, because one thing is what you call it, weighing thoughts, you know, the thoughts have weight and so on, because it means you, even if it's just a metaphor to take it, you know, I think, you know, certain ideas, you've got and um, feel them as beings or substances and uh, feel them in their, in their weight and their substantiality, that's all I can say, their substantiality. And when you do that, you're into this being world. And that's where way, and we don't like him, but good. Um, Bennett was very keen to say this, there's another dimension which is the of being, which is not like knowledge at all. And that's where you can ponder because you can weigh thoughts. That's the being world. And what, what are the thoughts? Uh, that's a totally different approach. It's more connected with the inner standing. Mm. You, see, you have an idea, and people who never, you know, it's like it's dashing around like a monkey, you know, kind of thing, um, Mercury. But uh, you, you just let it dwell and, um, and develop inside. And develops inside, and you. It's just beautiful, honestly, Debbie. It's really as I've been doing with you. It give me this opportunity, and in fact, you're not saying very much. In fact, you're absolutely critical to what's happening here. And you provide this 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 container, this vessel, you know, this something can come out there, and where these things can unfold, because you're not you need the unfolding with the containment, and it's quite an art. Um, this and it's for me crucial for all the realm of the true understanding, you know, the good of work and all the rest of it. But it's not you know, because people are losing themselves in their thoughts and. Yeah, I agree with people. You try to defence against thoughts. Yeah, you know, people say thoughts, thinking is bad. It, as you know, thinking is, is a bad. <laughs> 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 it's not real thinking at all. Um, and go to provide lots of hints if you haven't taken, like his insistence on mental images, which were Bennett picked up when he refer in certain exercises to the thinking centre. He said, uh, you do it. This is to do with mental images. And most people would not take the thinking centre to do with images at all. Because um, they couldn't relate it, maybe? Could, well, they couldn't relate it. You know, these, these, well, well, how is having an image relate to thinking? Because thinking with them is, 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 is you know, it's an activity, <laughs> buzzing around, and calculating and manipulating and so on. You know, and holding a mental image, you know, why? Because that's thinking in the realm of being, you see. It's, to doing, it's dealing with what is, whereas the only realm of thought is so it's becoming something else. You know what I mean? So leading on to something else. Mm -hmm. That's why people get disorganized by thinking. They can't kind of stay with anything. And so-called thinking of people is so they don't actually s so you stay with anything and trying to get to something better. Now all that stuff is so useful. And the other people like Krishnamurti and David Bowman, and their conversations about thinking are sort of absolutely brilliant and outstanding. Yeah, really amazing. And you see, in Steiner, you get this component called a clairvoyant vision, which is really his version of this, because he's he's seeing things clairvoyantly. But forget the clairvoyance of the way; it's just this bearing, you know, having this vision, this inner vision. This is this is this is what it is. You know. Now, so how can we lead this back to Zoroastrianism? Well, we just can't leave Zoroastrianism behind. Yeah. It's very good to. Uh, I've started on that was fantastic. To appreciate yes. when he was still recognised in the time of Islam, and there was this problem because of mm, those catastrophic events in, in Persia itself. They lost the, the time a lot of their scriptures, and they had to be rewritten in a certain time to be kitab, you know, people of the book to be accepted by Islam. And anyway. But the he was inclined, and some people have said that um, because of guessing that um, Ashiat Ashiamash represented Zoroaster. Yes, he's uh, one of my favourite characters, and many people said Ashiat Ashiamash, Ashiat Ashiamash. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and get it right, he was game to me because of. Um, 
it appeared to say, and it may be too crude for some people, this is kind of picture of it, that all he did with people was just talk with them. Uh, and uh, elicited, you know, from them this sense of conscience. You know, so I thought this was great, just no miracles, mm -hmm. no special powers. Yep. Yes. Uh, I thought this no is preaching. No preaching. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes, free feet of that. <laughs> yeah. And it was just a, and it's this, oh, because that, there is that thread in Gurdjieff who makes a meal out of it sometimes, and then so serious about this renunciation of powers. You should never use powers. Because um, um, I've tasted a bit in my own life, I actually saw, you know, could do things, but no, don't ever do that. You can, there are ways of influencing people, invoking experiences and so on, but don't do it. Yes, I think. And, this because it's, it's in a way dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. You operate on somebody with a power, it just really is. Well, that's the Aleister Crowley kind of end of things, and black magic, that is black magic, you know, using these powers to make people. Because so. you don't want to be superior if you're teaching people, or not teach, or mm. helping people. Mm. You want to try to be equal with them. Well, yes, that's the big thing. Big thing is equality, not difference. So not, um, and it's lovely. But well, it's a creative play. I think you know, Charles Storrs about the Sheikh and his pupil and how the uh, pupil um, wanted to really serve the Sheikh and so on. The Sheikh kept twisting it around. So always the <laughs> Sheikh was. The person of serving the pupil, whatever the pupil came up with, let's try this, let's try that. No, it would always be like that. Uh, and it's, it's, and it's, a one, it's, it's such a rich, and there's another thing, Debbie, I find about people, you know, you'd call it people, you know, they're imaginary beings called people. Uh, they, there's so much ignorance around nowadays. You don't see these amazing, you don't appreciate the stories. I was thinking the wonderful, you, you know, the novels of Hermann Hesse? I've never read them. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, <laughs> you cut me to the quick, you know. There's one journey to the east. It's um, a group of people making this journey. Some of them are actually people like Paul Clay, the painter. And there's a very short story, but in it turns out the person who looked after the people, the, the servant of it, Leo, was actually the master, which they only realized in the end. And there's a it's, it's only 90 pages. You could spend oh, it down one up. Book, Okay, you know, then. Sounds the, good. You look at it. Sounds like a take on Monkey Journey to the West. No, it's. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, his. I mean, his. Uh, well, I think mean, it's an example, you know, what do we do? I mean, we've got limited time. We could do something like his book, Steppenwolf, which is about many eyes in the most extraordinary way. And this uh, Siddhartha about the book. I mean, his. Well, maybe generational. For my generation, that was. Um, you know, influenced by people like Colin Wilson and so on, appreciation of these visionaries, and they've faded out. But they, it's a shame because they provided this this narrative material, these stories, which in a sense you need. I remember the meeting of Gurdjieff in, like in, in meeting of remarkable men in the context of his father, who was a, a bard, Ashok, you know, saying he regretted not taking more notice of, of traditional myths and stories, which he saw there's so much in it. Um, and in the modern age, people like Edward Shah and then began to, you know, wrote stories, these teaching stories, which I've uh, gone back to recently, and I think the most extraordinary. I don't know why people don't use these, let's neglect them. And this is a way of which, and he did world, you know, collections of world stories and so on. And it's this story material, and the horror thing happening now in schools now, you know, and parents not letting their children learn fairy stories because they're not true. And also because they say they're too violent. They're too violent. But yeah, kids love violence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was yeah. going to say. Kids do love the, they love the gore, they love the horror, they love being scared because they're still mm. willing to mm. go through those emotions. And you know about that, Debbie? We a study once, I can't quote the source, and I say the guy looked into what were the most long enduring, I think, fairy stories. Fairy stories they said there are always ones which contain something really nasty. <laughs> They're the ones remember. And why is it? Because, you know, my friend Matthias says, you know, in terms of the imagery and so on, you don't, um, you probably don't get very 
far and nice images is something a bit perverted in it that enables you to remember. And so there's a very deep psychology in all mm. of this. You see. There's a lesson to learn in mm -hmm. it, isn't there? Absolutely. So this, and you think power of good, you know, because he was I mean, full of comments about it and the crocodile's cunt and shit from the donkey and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And why was he doing it? Not because he was a rude man, well, probably was that as well, but it was just, it was just this, because he knew. It yes. makes things happen, doesn't yeah, it? If you yeah, hear it like that, yeah. Like that, you know. I've tucked out it, and you know why are people attracted to in a road accident and so on. And it's just you think this is a low character, you know, it's bad, something bad. But it's not. It's just this empirical psychology, or what gets you. Uh, and there isn't, if there isn't something like this, you don't really remember. This is why. Not why I'm, I'm I say this is why it's a lie. I'm just adding it because I just thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really getting a bit back into Shakespeare. I know why Shakespeare featured in my last seminar because I mean his way you know is now taken to be in a lot well a certain number of people take Shakespeare as the greatest thinker in England has ever been thinker. And also a book by Michael Bloom on how in a way that he claimed that, that um, Shakespeare created the the modern human individual. Oh, by giving, letting them have their story. Well, no, he yeah, actually created this, you know, this, you know, look at these great characters, Macbeth and Hamlet, Lear, Othello, uh, they all this was about uh, creating a vision of the human individual which really hadn't been there before. This is, a, this is the claim, you know, yeah. you need to believe in it. Um, and and it's haunted me a long time because when I was um, first at Coombe Springs, they had various books in there. At the time, the Silver was around and they were about threatening to ban Beelzebub. And one was Beryl Potchens. She was with um, Morris Nicole, who wrote this book, In the East My Pleasure Lies, which was a study of Shakespeare. I never got around to reading her book, but it haunted me. And Bennett used to say about Shakespeare that he really understood what in his system called the divine self, which is the actually the deep rooted consciousness in people self. And uh, so glad on this this episode of um getting into contact myself with there and you you see well yes an Englishman you you see and I I heard stories from I don't know Lisbeth perhaps I'm never testing them out the thing awfully how she how Gurdjieff detested Shakespeare you see and I say well more fools Gurdjieff <laughs> and this is doing the nature of his poetry but these incredible people who are you know because you get people interested in Gurdjieff and they become narrow they shut down into this funnel vision it's awful you know who is Goethe where is Shakespeare you know why do you think Gurdjieff didn't like Shakespeare then? Well, it was to do, I believe, and because I haven't verified this, I believe it was to do with nature of poetry because Shakespeare broke with the Eliz Elizabethan time was incredible literature, and you had was it Spencer, he wrote mm -hmm. the Fairy, Fairy Queen, Queen. Yeah. and we tested this because with Bennett, you know, you say, "Oh, let's test this." And we had actually made me went and heard somebody read the whole thing. The whole thing, the Fairy Queen, is all based on images. At, um, you know this and it's not just doing pictures it actually it, it's embedded in images it's actually very intense and of course in Shakespeare's sonnets there's like no images there's absolutely um, how to say it it's like super laws I don't know how to express it it's, in, 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 it's so extraordinary um, and it has elements in it as you know the scholars do it afterwards or in the original photos you can see each and actually even the the shape of the letters signified and the meaning of, of the sonnet uh, and how the play on words was paramount to normally would go to would despise the play on words when in the where word you know like this one sonnet this use of the word will in seven different ways in the same sonnet yeah you know all this kind of thing and he said no you want because Gurdjieff was based on this tradition of images and he hints at this in these enigmatic statements in meetings of remarkable men. We say, I now go on to this method of narrative, which involves, um, and I can't remember the exact phrase, 
for it. Um, but the obviously, ostensibly, is in on how you create this flow of images and that can carry something. And he's right, and I want to get back, get a connection with that with my friend Matthias about this. But it is known in all real storytellers, and they actually draw on a flow of images, I and mean, it's uh, like their own movie to do it. So that's what you see. Gojo, you know, and it pisses me off in all respects. He's total, I'm, I'm sure, in spite of what people like the late Keith Bozell <laughs> said, he didn't understand it and have a clue about modern science. Um, all his remarks about modern science are crap as far as I can I can see. And he's really misses the point. It's quite destructive in what he says. Um, in a way, like he's also, I think, quite destructive by women. And this must be acknowledged. He's an incredible man in his own right, but he's, you know, there's certain elements you want to say, I don't want to go along with you this past, Mr. Gojo. You know, yeah, I might then think I think. Because I remember this. Uh, I won't say his name, but one of the conferences, uh, all and everything, and suddenly give it this lecture about objective science. And I was appalled. I tried to interrupt him twice, and then the people running the session prevented me from saying anything more. Because <laughs> he produced this abysmal rendering of modern science, the quantum mechanics and relativity. He didn't know what the f he was talking about. And he had all these diagrams from the books which he didn't understand a thing of, you can tell. He went what, wittering on about Gurdjieff's there is objective science and how poor modern science was. And I just wanted to smack his head in. <laughs> he was a total moron and twit. You know, and but isn't he allowed his idea of what he thinks Gurdjieff's work is, or do you think he got it completely wrong so it just shouldn't be spoken? Well, well I wanted, you know, well, I used to want to get up and, sh and shout at him, and I wasn't allowed to, so I was upset. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. You piss off, you know. I wanted to throw ripe tomatoes at him. I don't care, you know. Because that is the problem with Gurdjieff not being around today. We've got all and everybody trying to decide <laughs> oh, what he was oh, trying yeah. to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, what does one do when one has one's own measure? I mean, it, um, it's um, kind of the hidden uh, side of Bennett's wonderful saying, integration without rejection. I say, I really devoted that principle. But I always say, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they should have let you speak. We should all be allowed to say what we feel if something, you know, as long as it doesn't turn into a major fight or an argument, that, mm -hmm. and that you are lurching across the room to mm -hmm. kick his head in. <laughs> well, it's it. Well, you see, good to say two things. Of course, the master about this once is a uh, to understand is to agree. Yes. The one he said, truth comes out of argument. Mm -hmm. You see, well, so you can have healthy debate. Yeah, yeah, you can have some argument in it. Eh? But still, people got this addiction. I know, really, personally, I just say I hate this point of view, and I'm going to argue as much as I can. As a guy who runs a department in the VNA. Um, saw him with bias a couple of few years ago, and he gave me a talk at that. I think he was at that. Yeah, John Smith, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, we should mention his oh, name sorry. On, you know, on this. Yeah. Thing. But, um, and I, so I took him to task about all of this, and he said, No, no, because he's got this belief. It's the belief in this ancient science and so on. Now, this belief in ancient science uh, had at one time a very creative result, but it's with a lot of propisals, namely you go great people like Newton you know, he was into all sorts of things, but he was into this the occult history, alchemy particularly in this notion, because there are books around from the Hermetica and so on, but some trend came out about Chaldean science, C H A L D E N, which is around Babylon and so on. Because um, a, a lot of things hanging around there, even the things like Enoch uh, studied astronomy in Britain and, and Noah was a, an astronomer and all this kind of stuff floating around. Anyway, he was seeped in this idea about an ancient science and was, he was aware of you know these amazing stuff, the pyramids to some extent, he was interested, knew about them. And there's something in the past there which got lost. Now, what, what did he do? Well, and there is also, and I must add in this because I tell everybody as much as possible, his um, name is, I call it something, something Jones, an American science fiction writer. I don't think it is Jones, but I can't remember his name. So anyway. 
and he was a beautiful story about creativity and belief and it was where physicists got contacted by um, governmental authorities saying we want to invite you to take part in the project oh what was it we can't tell you uh, we're going to meet in this house in this place you know with various people and we'll present to you what the task is you know they meet uh, people you know, knew some of them didn't know others all kinds of disciplines and they said well the situation is this this chap here so and so um, who had an accident in his laboratory and died appears to have invented anti-gravity and all we got left is the bits of mangled machinery some notes, his library but if this chap has done it it must be possible to over to you chaps so person in, in the story goes to take part in it um, and they just they look at the the notes are like gibberish, the bits of remaining apparatus are incomprehensible. <laughs> this library is full of occult stuff. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? So science and esotericism. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah everything. It's just, it just a chaos, a mixture of things, you see. And um, this chap goes and struggles away because he kept on going, oh, this chap has done it, so it must be possible. This chap has done it, so he's then watching Eddie's and then he comes out. Uh, so he invents an anti-gravity machine, which is you know not like the one for it's extremely heavy, goes two inches above the ground, but it's an anti-gravity machine. And then of course they tell him there was no such man. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But people wouldn't have made the effort to do so, unless they believed it was possible. Yes. You know, the, it was the, what's it, the three minute, uh, four minute mile, I thought which was, was it three minutes or four minute mile, the banister? Yes. Three or four minutes? Four minutes, I four think. Four minutes, whatever it was. Yeah. And you see, people didn't believe it was possible. And he did, and people started doing it all the time. Yeah. And so there's a power here. So back to things about, okay, about, in, you know, Goethe's ideas and so on. But they, what, what I find these people doing is knocking modern science, which they are probably not really versed in. Yeah. And they're missing all the incredible stuff in modern science and mathematics, just dismissing it out of hand. And not doing anything in themselves at all. So just adhering to an image of belief, and I think that's disgraceful. You know, it was like um, Feynman, the American physicist, would say he gets all sorts of wacky ideas about the universe. He says, that's fair enough, I don't mind wacky ideas. But none of these people put the work in to justify their idea. Mm. They don't come up, they don't put graft. He said, I'm a scientist, you've got to put the work in. Yes. <laughs> don't matter yes. what the idea is, I'm open to anything. <laughs> the universe can be made of blue cheese, but find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's that. And then we're coming to a close. You want to looking at your watch here and so on. But this is we got to the threshold. You see of you know these um, uh, well, laws, and that's the um, whole idea of laws in Gurdjieff is problematic because and uh, again, it, when you come across anybody and going into etymology of this and. It's also in our English word, laws and so on, because it has these this twofold connotation, which change, you know, laws, civic law, the social law, so to speak, and it's very much by Roman ideas, you see. Mm -hmm. But then how it came into laws of nature, I still haven't sussed out, I want to find out more about how it became laws of nature, because you get then a source of major confusion, you know, and because you see, the law, in life is dependent on those authority, you know, like a parliament or a dictator yes. or whatever it is who sets the law, other people obey the laws that are to be obeyed, and they project this idea on natural law. So who, who's the authority in natural law? That's right, and you've got his endlessness or wherever the creator God is you happen to fancy, you know, kind of thing, but it's, it's ridiculous. Um, there's a, in Islam, there's a lovely phrase, the laws of nature are the habits of Allah. Hmm. That's a good one, I like that, yeah. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and the philosopher George Charles Sanders Pierce said the, it's called equals freeness. It's like uh, the natural laws evolve, and that's much more a modern idea of emergence. As it's, I mean, there isn't a kind of diktat of here is the law, 
you see universe now you universe obey this law this is profidocious I mean this is just, you know, there's this other way where it's kind of more interesting to me anyway it's, it's, it's emergent but you see going back to Gurdjieff and what's happened with his teaching and so on there's been this I call it this right wing authoritarian factor in it which comes from perpetuating even though it's very radically challenged in many ways, perpetuating this top-down view of the universe, which there's some kind of divine authority somewhere, which we can be privy to because we've read Gurdjieff. <laughs> I think, oh no. <laughs> if you ever start thinking that way, go and cut your head off. I mean, really, it is not on at all. You know, so I find a way to get to this inner standing you know, how to come to these things. You see, there's elements, you know, called imagery, and sensations, and feelings, and all this wonderful riches. So it makes me despair people when they go to these groups and they chat about themselves and observing themselves. I don't know who they are, what they think they are, and they, there's nothing about the actual stuff and this incredible organism. Mm. And it's, what has come out and is how all the way all of human all of terrestrial evolution is, is in this body and there's no appreciation of this because people want this external authority which they can buy into and become therefore elevated above other people. But isn't that their ego, isn't it? Yeah, Being yeah, fed and going, yeah. Yeah. I'm enjoying this so you know, it wants to work on it. That's or right. show off and then inflate itself. Mm -hmm. I was mindful then of the story, I think it could have been the other, there's another Krishnamurti who was a total skeptic, he's a very interesting man. But, but after the, he was after the Theosophical Krishnamurti, wasn't he? No, I'm talking about the other Krishnamurti, not that one. Right. There's another Krishnamurti, entirely different. And he was, he was getting to it, the scene is you get these hierarchical groups, like the foundation, and you think, you know, that was the thing with the pyramid thing, like pyramid selling. You work your way through the ranks. Mm -hmm. You try to get to the top, you see. Cause I notice at each stage you, you get the sense where you've shown something more than you were at the previous stage. And that's the kind <laughs> of incentive, you know. Like, you know, in the foundation, so you're allowed to come to a movers class. You get a tent for so many years at so and so. You get to another thing. But there's this, in this um, cynical picture, it says the, you get to the, you know, the top. And then what is there at the top, the ultimate, Truth, insight, you know, and because the child gets to the top and finds there isn't anything. So, disappointing. <laughs> you know, what's what's he going to do then? And he has a choice. Carries on perpetuating the scam, or, or reveals, or splits in it in the way. Christian mercy, I don't want to sort of split from it. Mm -hmm. I said no, no. Then it's staying inside a bit. You see. But that's, you could see, feel the dilemma of this person getting there. And if you look around, and in a way, it's all a contract. Because why? And it's diabolical because it's based on withholding information from people in the name of superior status. I am higher than you. I can see more than you. You are not yet worthy of what I have. And if you pay me some more money or just sweat on my behalf, <laughs> then you might get another tidbit. Mm. This is such straightforward, diabolical practice. I don't, people are not, people aren't, because they, you still got this residue of believing the authorities. Like we had here in this place, in the gallery, which was once a Victorian school, and I don't know if you ever went to the club room, and it was, it's painted out now, but they had a mantelpiece from the aspire, and they had engraved on this, the stonework there, Obey those who have authority over you. No, I've always been a rebel, so I would have not liked that. <laughs> no, but you see, that's still going on. You know, that's still going on. And so, Mr. God, they're turning Mr. God into a tyrant, you know, mm. a dictator, and all this sort of thing. So, this all comes around to this portrayal, you know, of this Holy Son Absolute and his endlessness, rejecting it. And then, and then there's this takes you through this extraordinary process of you know, how was this interlacing, interweaving of 
having these semi-autonomous elements, you know, because it's all enabling the maintenance of something. But he doesn't. Um, there are other ways of looking at things, including the man called um, Scotus Ergena in the 6th century AD, a Christian, a remarkable man, and he's talking about he had really got play with this idea of creation. He said there is the, the created and the uncreated, there is the created creating, and all in those he ended up, and I can't do it accurately here enough from my memory about the four states, but there is the um, this idea of some kind of idea like the created creating. But creating, you see, in good you've talked about world creation, world maintenance. But the world itself capable of creating, and that was the sense he associated with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost to me is very interesting because it given the character role of perfecting. So the Father is creating, the Son is redeeming, and the Holy Ghost is perfecting. And it's the perfecting of the existential real world, you and I. Mm -hmm. And we're all in that game. You know, not asked to be anything but what you are. But it's like an ongoing development. Yeah, do it better. <laughs> because then, and there's lovely images and that become you know, what they call a, a true individual, and then you become like a bead on the necklace of God. And the, the, again, Gurdjieff plays with this, you know. What's the only, originally all the special individuals get to the Holy Son Absolute and dwell on there. Now in this period they're not getting there. They're just looking at it and longing from purgatory and getting upset. You know, we're not there with the one, you know, united with God and so on. Um, but uh, I'm just thinking of the, uh, oh, just flashing notes of wrong association, but you know, the, in the Sistine Chapel, the creation of um, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, and you've got God there with angels, and also with Eve tucked under his arm, and you know, this kind of thing. So that's God and the Holy Son Absolute, you see, with all the other beings. You could, of course, in, in Gurdjieff, yeah. the Zen is dwelling there with his cherubim and seraphim. He's got a mob round him, and they're administrating the universe, you know, and then there's the side which is marginalized later on, you see. So, what the hell is all this entourage he's got around him? And all that? So, he needs the workers. <laughs> Yeah, well then the workers, and now we're on to a whole other thing from the Mesopotamian realm, which is outstanding. I mean, this Gurdjieff replied his father was you know, to the Sumerians, the great Sumerians, and the enemy of Elish were on high, and the oh, idea of the, the Anunnaki, the gods of Sumeria, they had the job of looking after the universe, and so they got fed up with this. So what do they do? They created man, partly from the earth and partly from the blood of Kingo, who was the consort of Tiamat. Tiamat, the original principle who they had divided in two to make heaven and earth, uh, making man. As so we can do his work. We yeah, can do so we, his work. our worship, you so, so relieve the Anukai of their job. Mm -hmm. And I think this is outstanding. Because <laughs> we were just... Um, Dogs' bodies. Yeah, we're just slaves. Well, Calvin, that's a powerful thing. That's a background to see all the Gurdjieff's ideas. And uh, why bother with it? Because then you say, which is right, which is wrong, true, or false. And in other words, but just, I see as why I use that term for my, my book, gymnasium. Just, this is gymnasium, just work up a sweat. Uh, well, Get into it, you know, because you, you can get an acceleration. Yeah, get the blood pumping. Blood, blood pumping, yeah. What is this blood pumping? It's, it's, God bless him, good, you feel so physical. <laughs> you know, not conceptual, it's physical. It's, it's the blood of the body, humble it's in the blood of the spirit body, uh, of the second body. Because the life force is in the blood. Yeah, all that prana. You know, this is to be celebrated and, and so on. So maybe we have to leave it there, but then what happens? What was this magic of this, this turning around? Um, maybe I'll try and finish with one, which again won't be too detailed or coherent, but the, this comes to the third series where he's talking about um, 
how can he remember himself and he goes ah God oh is God and he goes back to God and to God is I am in my world like God in his world you see and what did God do God sent away the most precious part of himself mm -hmm. um, uh, and because of that it enabled him dot 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 and I believe it was so that uh, in a way it's it, it go to place again with all traditions. See what it sent away with himself was of course the the devil and Lucifer were also the most beloved. So it's in a way like twins? No, know, not twin mentioned twins, I was just talking about what if he sent away was Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Lucifer is um was one time his favourite son which is a you know, challenge towards uh, the Christ image and so on, but this is so. As I say, I can't do it properly or accurately. I will read the third series is in there. Um, and um, in, then this, I mean, I haven't done it yet, read, read properly Milton's Paradise Lost, which is all about this role of Lucifer, how mm. Lucifer was the most divine angel and rebelled against what God was doing with men and all of that anyway we don't need to go too much in there I just mentioned it because I, it came into my mind all by itself and that's about all of that there is all this richness and like you mentioned um, I know maybe before we started talking about Judas and so on and I was so struck when you look at Gurdjieff's alternative view of Judas to the mainstream but then you look at somebody like Borges the Argentinian writer, he has this wonderful thing called three versions of Judas, which gives three totally different interpretations again of Judas, you see. But I bet the people who get hooked on Gurdjieff Judas never look at Borges, because Borges, you see, is just a writer. Well, Gurdjieff is a holy man. I would look it up, but... Mm, Borges, mm. three versions of Judas, it just... Because I must not, I don't remember the bit about Lucifer in the third series, but that oh. is very interesting. Well, I think it is, I could again be mistaken. If I'm mm. mistaken, I'm mistaken. I shall find it, yeah. Oh, you find it. But he, so he sent mm. just Lucifer away, not Lucifer yeah. and Jesus, just no, Lucifer, no, no, or the no. Christ. It is, it's, it's peculiar in that sense, and I made much of it in my, I read that paper on active mentation. But it's just, you now it comes, I'm trying to bring back to, at least to this emanation of the modified laws into the universe you could tell you is because it's an incredible theme in human culture you know the theme of sacrifice mm -hmm. this wonderful thing in the naughty gods you know Odin sacrifices himself to himself on the tree mm -hmm. no to get the knowledge and the wisdom well, no, yeah. I don't know whether it was you know that was developed after Christianity or independent of Christianity because the Norse gods are obscure, but I thought, I blew my mind, Sacri Odin sacrifices himself to himself on the tree. Oh, wow! Because I always read that as he'd sacrificed his ego. No, oh, do you see the concept? Oh, for me, I'm not even mind saying so, the struggle of the ego is this concept. You know, what was um, this notion of the, um, which of course is, was absolutely epitomised in Christianity and the whole crucifixion thing, which people these days don't like. Because it's all bloody and messy and horrible and all that thing. We don't let's go and chant and sing bells and do all this nice incense stuff and meditate and <laughs> we don't have to bother about all that stuff. That God could actually suffer, you know, for us. I mean, that, that, that basic idea is so extraordinary. Um, Gurdjieff bypasses it all. He you know, didn't suffering. He just puts God in this world of um, having to deal with a insolvable problem. Mm. It seems he, how does he get out of this fix? And so that was his particular act of creative genius to invent that picture. Because you always got to say, well, why does God bother? Yeah, I often ask that myself. Why yeah. does God bother with any of this? Uh, you know, yeah. There's got to be a reason. God must have a reason. And Gurdjieff uh, said, well, because he had a you know, problem, his house was shrinking. Mm. You know, I think, okay. But, because they're mostly here. Okay, but then you've got to go through all this. And going through this is is what counts. But, um, but this separation, the sacrifice, you know, that, and I don't know because I'm I'm very much a coward and, and weakling. But 
this um, this is my dear late friend over Matchett who was uh, in a way a spiritual genius in his own right he used to say that evolution proceeds by the sacrifice of the most precious say that again evolution proceeds, proceeds from the sacrifice of the most precious yeah, which is contrary to what people would want to believe in isn't it you see oh you give away what is most precious you see this is and it is, you know, for me, I know I don't conform to it, but it, every time I just hear the words, I, sh I cringe, I shouldn't you know, think, ah, because this is like a taste of reality. This is like what God does, this is what people do, this is what nature does. It's just, but it's, you can't, because it's completely against ordinary, like today's thinking, which is puerile. Mm -hmm. you know, sacrifice the most precious, you're an idiot, you know, you just want more. Amplify it what's most precious to you. That's the sensible way to do it. Get a plan, you know, get a bank loan, whatever, you know. Nothing about it. This has got that twist in it, which is there. You don't, you don't proceed by more. You actually advance by less, which is completely counterintuitive. <laughs> But you see, David, thanks for the conversation. It's um, that reflection on it, because I'm so, as you know, so fascinated in the process, and I think there is a, a kind of thinking which isn't really like what most people regard thinking as at all. Um, it is, uh, it partakes strongly in language and words. And again, Gurdjieff was maestro and use of words mm. that kind of thing and which um, doesn't require and it sounds ridiculous and require to be true or false right or wrong better or worse and it, putting it like that could sound just wishy-washy you see well, so what you know where, where's, where's the punchline there is a punchline in, uh, or a concern about authenticity because you know, I found it, you know, in a little way in my life, you know, Debbie, because I've been involved with Bennett in giving lectures, and I still remember in town, I gave a talk somewhere in London, and Liz was there, and he said, she, oh, well, you look very good and all that, and you know, so, you know, but do you believe in it? And I suddenly thought, do I believe in it? You know, and I don't. Do you walk the talk? <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. And I don't, perhaps I don't. And I've always I have had that sort of dilemma. Well, let's see. Um, what matters to me not being this or that, but that that's the thing. What is authentic? I'm talking to you now. Um, yeah. Well, where's the truth for me? And it's here. I, where's the truth of it? It's not by reliance on any authority or mechanism or method or anything like this. It just it's been true to oneself. No, it's not quite. I can't quite put my finger on it and give it a name, but it has to be this authenticity. I'm just so I became. Let's go back to my work I did years and years ago, and I'm just re revising it or looking at it lately. When I did research work in the College of Technology with science students and so on, and I got them to um, actually draw the images they had in mind when they were thinking about physics. It's quite, sounds quite modest, but it's quite revolutionary in some respects because it had to say, you just all you do is you know, bring out what you're sort of speak seeing in your mind, and you're just bringing it out. You're not asserting it. <laughs> you're not justifying it. But you just this is how it seems to me, and that's straightforward way of seeing this is how it seems to me. And why? Because possibly I don't know if you've been able to do it. You see, or notice it in yourself. I want to be able to do this with people so that instead of nonsense like telepathy and so on, you can speak of something, and when I'm speaking of something, it's actually evolving in front of me, so to speak. It is actually there. And I'm interested in what's there, not what's in me towards you or to anybody else, not from and to, because it's simply there. And so. It doesn't require, or you may want to, but it's your choice, agreement or disagreement at all. It just 
or requires this participation. There is this. Um, I'm running on to another thing, and I say I wouldn't you have to start um, <laughs> to stop me. And there's a lovely game done by this extraordinary physicist, Archibald Wheeler, who's an American physicist, a really, really extraordinary genius. He died by the age of 101 or something, and he is, but he invented a game, a quantum game, and I've only tried it once or twice, but once and perhaps, and then very difficult to do in a way. It's, it's like um, 20 questions. I mean, what do you do? I may have described it to you before. I think. What you do? You have a group of people, not too many, until it doesn't know something. And when person starts, and when they start by um, bringing to mind an object, that's all. Then when the other people ask them a question, is it, um, I don't know, is it artificial? And the person answers yes or no. But can only answer yes or no. Yeah, only yes or no. Right. Now the person when asked the question takes that limited information he said and finds a, an image which corresponds to an object which fits the previous answer, and he has the image. Then the other person says, you know, um, uh, is it larger? Is it larger than a human being? And they said, no. Then that person creates an image which accommodates these two answers. <laughs> and it goes on until everybody in the room sees the same object. Wow, that could take forever. <laughs> well, no, I've done it in it, it didn't take forever. Um, oh, so he's. Okay. Yeah, but it, what's interesting about it, he said, you know, there's something, there's an object there which doesn't exist before, and but everybody has made it. <laughs> and so it's quite extraordinary exercise. I was wanted a chance because like so many things I love to do require this time and patience and working through and you know being able to have the space to explore it. And I actually did this in Massachusetts at the Camp Caravan and remember it was the end object was a computer chip no, um casino chip. And that was the end object. I was I was very dim, dim at the end getting it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is beautiful, you see, because this is what it's about. It's, 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 it's something which is there. And for me, because this is the empirical side world stuff about you know, the inner world and so on. I'm really hip with the inner world, yeah, but it's tangible. Uh, and it's not in the sense it's in me or in you. It's like being in me is pathetic. It's there. Yes, you know, but it's, it has to be approached in this way, and that's why I was fine with people having good conversation. It there's a sense, deluded or not, that we're actually looking at the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, in only discourse, people never pause to even consider: Are we actually looking at the same thing? Is it going off their subjective associations with the words? Mm. You know, but it's there. So now I've got. This is kind of weird. If I try to paint it, it look absolutely stupid. It's an absolute and the nothingness and the, the laws and all that stuff. It's all a weird little picture, uh, but it's it's there. And of course, this is just the sort of thing that say Einstein did when he developed relativity. It's like that asshole who gave the talk about objective science to have no idea about relativity or where it came from. And it was what was Einstein doing? He was being a light ray, <laughs> traveling. He was in that world, and all this wonderful world of well, it's a lot of scientists empirically come to this. Like Bohm himself, he would live, could live in what's called plasma and experience it in himself. And this never comes in the papers. Never comes into popular science at all. As you, this power, you know. It is the same as Blakeian imagination. You know, it's being, it's the being thinking, it's entering into these things. And when you do that, you always make a profit. It's, you don't, mm. don't have any right answers. No, that's it. But it's a ball. Yes. Yeah. It's the taking part, it's the experiencing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, God bless Zarathustra. Yes, indeed. God bless Zarathustra and all the others. Also, Sprach Zarathustra, and we ought to have the music of 
<laughs> playing as we fade yeah. out. I should yeah. see if I can do that and not get us done for copyright with YouTube's new rules oh, about God, <laughs> it's just getting terrible, whether it be allowed. It? But if I can, I'll do it. Or maybe we'll have to hum it. There's a latest Tippy again for something new because I realised this whole stream of I was talking to my friend Carol yesterday about all this about movies and the esoteric nature of movies. Mm. So we've done this sort of our chemical study of 2001. Um, and it's bound to have been there, but I was so surprised to come across it. So we're living in a world where, of truly, of all and everything, not just Gertrude's sure. all and everything, yes. but his was just an introduction. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Tony. That was marvellous. Oh. And I'm looking forward to doing more of these. Oh, lovely. I, what an opportunity, because <laughs> you can trust me enough to just you know, allow me to indulge in this way. Going, because, you know, you've got to have this this, this, this confidence. This, uh, I'm so happy to have this touchstone, this being experience. You know, go to talking in this book a lot about being logic, being this, being that. And I, it's just, oh, that being stuff of good. Yes. Now I'm, of course. You know, and you get, what's it, what's it, accept no substitutes. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? But what we usually end on is you just quickly tell me about your website if people want to come to your courses or workshops, oh. or what's on in the future. Oh, the, I'd um, love to see you my money, absolutely. Or name it and say where people can find your website. Okay, my website is under the name of diversity, and I was explained where diversity is chosen for many reasons, but especially for the fact that nobody else would use it. <laughs> so it's quite protected. It's D U V E R S I T Y, diversity or diversity. You partly coming from Venice Dramatic Universe, and so it's www.diversity.org, and they can find that. I haven't got quite up to date in announcing the seminars next year, but there are two main events next year, um, maybe three. And the one is, I want to follow up on this year's seminar on gesture, which is based in the way on Gurdjieff's movements, but not restricted to it, like our conversation, you know, restricted to it. I want to get at the meaning of gesture, both secular and spiritual, and prayer, and so on, and also as a way in which a very intrinsic and powerful way in which we can communicate with ourselves and I think it only truly can be done through gesture. But I'm going to incorporate it in that elements I'm evidently taken from Bennett about sacred images. His discourses on sacred images were so powerful and this relates to something very important which I th would only be able to hint at because it's, it's, it's far beyond me but important to remember that his intrinsic task which I'm not sure whether he fulfilled in his life, was to create a new form of worship which people of today could practice. And as far as we know, he is associated with the creation of a new sacred image, which in a way may be happening already, and was located in what he called unconditional nature. Uh, there is a way in which by the end of his life he got, and I think I briefly mentioned it, I'm not sure, in our conversation just now, you know, in the place he said where we, uh, now we have been um, disillusioned of both, both God and mammon. <laughs> and what is that? So is this third path, what is this? It's done it in the sense of sacred nature. And that's one thing then in the in Nashville, at the end of the year, in October and thereabouts, in the session like this year, was around the Brave New World image which brought up Shakespeare and things like the Biosphere Experiment and many other things. And so I was going to take the theme of the Ark, the Ark of Noah, and our main stream traditional element will be this time William Blake as last one oh, was. One of my favourites. Oh, Good yeah. old William Blake. Oh, <laughs> who kind of love the no, William Blake? And so I'm going to take that theme, but I've also, as in my events, trying to bring in other things that I mean, <laughs> I'm going to put it like this, say, 
the thermodynamics of spiritual practice. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring physics, because I was saying again, I almost admire a Bennett and sometimes as critic, I admire his wonderful book, Energies, uh, this span from thermodynamics to the divine operations of the Eastern Church all in one scheme, I just, it still blows my mind. But he had something because he understood thermodynamics, which brings us back almost to the theme of our talk, the merciless hero and entropy. This is something so deep. And also, I must add that in terms of physics, you see, most people don't realize that the, there are these major things that everybody knows about, like relativity and quantum mechanics and the problem of their resolution. But the queen of them all, the major one of them all, is the 19th century, has got the laws of thermodynamics. Now these, you know, some scientists say these are the really ultimate laws of the laws of thermodynamics. And that's better. So people don't know about, it's always usually fine, people know about two, but not three. And you add the three and everything changes. Anyway. So that's that. So all of that, then a uh, nice little enterprise we're going to do next year, possibly in September, where we're going to have a jolly event in Costa Rica, <laughs> <laughs> in these sort of times where we're going to be more exploring theatre and hopefully by that time we have developed with my friend Jesai James the, uh, a workshop on enacting the first chapter of Beelzebub, of the arousing of thought. You know, by then we'll have something online so we can, even with the unprepared audience, begin, begin to do something with it so that people can experience it and just plot through the reading of it, you know, kind of thing. And anyway, there's lots of material on our website, you know, incredible amounts of material, background of documents and references and links and that, all the rest of it. So please uh, take part in that. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you everybody for listening. And um, make sure that you have fun and play lots of games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Again. <laughs>